Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, and love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. The study of eschatology, or the study of future events as prophesied in the Bible, as many know, can take you on a lot of rabbit trails, trying to figure out things like pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-mill, on-mill, etc. can get you really bogged down. Shoot, I think Satan's counting on people getting confused to keep us from learning about the excitement and comfort that comes from understanding Bible prophecy. So to help clear up a lot of the confusion, we have a great presentation by internationally known author and speaker Ron Rhodes entitled, Eight Great Debates in Bible Prophecy. It's a fun presentation and you're going to learn a lot. Enjoy. Well, it's good to be here. I was thinking of writing a book called Reasoning from the Scriptures with the Bible Answer Man. <clears throat> what do you think? Kind of a catchy title, huh? By a show of hands, how many of you are present today? Okay, okay. You see, I asked that because this is the after lunch session, and it's a special session with Steal the Mind. This is the uh, session with various levels of altered states of consciousness. And if somebody starts snoring next to you, a sharp elbow in the ribs is appropriate. It's really a pleasure to be here to talk to you today. I must tell you that I am voice impaired today. But instead of giving the devil victory, I decided to show up anyway and speak. And uh, just trust the Lord through this. I've got some water up here and some coffee, and we'll just hope that I get through all of this. Amen? Amen. I'm going to talk about uh, eight great debates of Bible prophecy. But you know, uh, a few weeks ago, I saw an article on conferences done in the United States, and I found it very interesting. There was a plastic surgeon's conference that was held in Scarsdale, New York. I, go figure that. What are the chances of that? <coughs> there was a mystery writer's conference held in Erie, Pennsylvania. Well, I wish I could have gone to that one. There was a Weight, weight Watchers conference in Gainesville, Florida. You know, I bet you that one was packed out, don't you think? There was a lawyer's conference in Sioux City, Iowa. <laughs> well, in my opinion, prophecy conferences are much more important than all those topics. And I think that we need them in every city in America because I believe America is in trouble today. And if there's one thing that can get people's attention, I believe it is the prophetic scriptures. That's what got my attention so many years ago. In fact, I thought I was a Christian because I went to church. But uh, at the time I was in showbiz, uh, you'll laugh at this, but I used to do a lot of the big network shows like The Tonight Show and Merv Griffin and Mike Douglas and Dinah Shore and American Bandstand. I was a rock and roller. You know, I had long hair, if you can picture me with long hair. <laughs> Backstage one day, I was talking to Shirley Boone, Pat Boone's wife, and she was crying tears of joy from her relationship with the Lord. And they were very much into Bible prophecy. Long story short, I dumped Hollywood, went to Dallas Theological Seminary and got trained, and I've been involved in ministry ever since, and I haven't looked back. So, <laughs> praise the Lord. You know, talking about the eight debates of Bible prophecy is important, if only for the reason that a lot of the Bible is prophetic in nature. In fact, out of the 23,000 verses in the Old Testament, about 6,600 are prophetic. Out of the 7,900 verses in the New Testament, about 1,700 are prophetic. And that means that about a fourth of the Bible is prophecy. Now, that's too much of the Bible to ignore. Would you agree with me on that? Yes. You know, it's interesting that these debates have given rise to a brand new language. We call it Christianese. Amillennialism, postmillennialism, premillennialism, pre-tribulationism, mid-tribulationism, post-tribulationism, covenant theology, dispensationalism. Boy, it's enough to get people confused for the next 100 years, isn't it? Unfortunately, I think especially today, Christians tend to get very animated on all of this. In fact, I've been called a heretic because I'm a pre-trib. Yeah. And I've heard pre-tribs use the term heretic of post-tribs. I've heard preterists use the term heretic of pre-tribs. Why, these days it could be downright dangerous to be a pre-trib. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean. I hate to say it, but some people get a little bit testy when talking about Bible prophecy. Yes, some people probably need to drink a little bit less coffee when they're talking about Bible prophecy. 
And I would say that some people just need to take a deep breath when talking about Bible prophecy. Personally, I think we all need to get along, even though we're different. <laughs> yes, we have differences, but we should still be loving with each other. Yes, we're different, but we should still be kind to each other. And yes, we are different, but we should still be courteous and forgiving. <laughs> Do I hear an amen on that? <laughs> My advice is, let's be strong with our beliefs, but courteous to believers who differ with us. Now let's just hop right into this because I don't have much time with you today. Uh, should prophecy be interpreted literally or allegorically? You know why I'm starting with this debate, right? It's, it's important because it determines everything else. You see, depending upon how you interpret prophecy, you're going to end up in different places. For example, on the Millennial Kingdom, if you interpret prophecy literally like I do, then you're going to come out believing that Revelation 20 teaches a literal millennial kingdom which Christ will rule over for 1,000 years. If you interpret Scripture allegorically, however, uh, especially the prophecies, then you might come out thinking that maybe the 1,000 years is not literal. It just refers to a long time. And so the millennial kingdom is Christ's reign over the church for a long time. There's not going to be a literal kingdom on earth. So you can see two different viewpoints two different interpretive methodologies. This is an important question. Same thing with the covenant promises that God has made. And you've got the Abrahamic covenant, you've got the Davidic covenant. I interpret those literally. I believe that God made unconditional covenants to Israel. And God is a promise keeper. So based upon those literal interpretations of those covenants, I believe that God will ultimately fulfill those covenants in the millennial kingdom including the land promises of the Abrahamic covenant and the throne promises of the Davidic covenant. It's going to happen, folks. But the other side that interprets things allegorically, they will tell you, no, Israel was not obedient. These were conditional promises. And besides, the church replaces Israel so that all the promises made to Israel are fulfilled in the church. You see, two different viewpoints Two different methodologies. Am I hearing some boos out there? <laughs> <clears throat> My basic policy is this. When the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense lest you end up in nonsense. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> Take preterism as an example. Here's a guy walking around downtown, holding up a sign. Relax. It all happened in 70 A.D. Now, I don't think you're going to ever see that. But nevertheless, that just doesn't make good sense to me. When I look at the book of Revelation, it seems to me that chapters 4 through 18 deal with a futuristic tribulation. And chapter 19, the second coming. Chapter 20, the millennial kingdom and great white throne judgment. And chapter 21 and 22 refers to the eternal state. It makes very good sense to me. So why should I stretch my imagination and try to believe this other viewpoint? I was invited to this church in Houston, Texas. I had heard about what was going on there. And so I decided to visit one day. And I went up to the pastor and I asked the pastor, what do you believe about the second coming? And he said, the second coming is when a person finds God again in their hearts. And I asked, what about Jesus? And he said, Jesus is one of many ways to salvation. So I quoted all the good verses, you know, the John 14, 6, and the Acts 4, 12, 1 Timothy 2, 5. Peter said, there's no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved. And this guy said to me, Ron, I feel sorry for you going through life so narrow-minded. <laughs> and I said, Jesus said, narrow is the way. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> As I was driving away from the church, I have to confess to you I lost my sanctification. I was praying that the Lord would send a giant fireball to dissolve the church. <laughs> but my wife, Carrie, talked me down. And we started praying good things for the church. Some of you may know that I was on the Bible Answer Man for eight years. Uh, Walter Meyer, uh, Martin is the guy that hired me. And six months later, he went to be with the Lord. And so I got drafted to be on the Bible Answer Man. And the week after I was on, CRI got a letter saying, 
Why on earth are you letting a pre-trib heretic on that show? And they asked this question, why would anyone believe in a pre-trib rapture? Well, I told them, I said, when the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense lest you end up in nonsense. That's why I'm a pre-trib. That's what the biblical data teaches, in my opinion. I must tell you that this basic interpretive policy led me to believe the following. If you want to understand how God will fulfill prophecy in the future, then examine how he fulfilled it in the past. Does that make sense? When you look at the Old Testament, there's over 100 messianic prophecies fulfilled in the New Testament of the, of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Isaiah 7.14, he's going to be born of a virgin. That literally happened. Micah 5.2, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. That literally happened. Zechariah 12.10, he's going to be pierced for our sins. That literally happened. Isaiah 53, uh, verses 1 to 5 or so, talks about how he's going to work in atonement for our sins at his death. Uh, Genesis 12, the Abrahamic covenant, he's going to be born from the line of Abraham. 2 Samuel 7, he's going to be born from the line of David. I mean, I could just keep going on and on, but those prophecies were fulfilled quite literally. And because of that, it's my opinion that all the prophecies are of the second coming and all the events that lead up to the second coming will be fulfilled just as literally. Now that makes good sense to me. In the plain sense, it makes good sense, right? So it makes good sense to me that the precedent has been set. Now I know what you're thinking. What about those symbols and the figures of speech that you see in Revelation? Well, I got you covered. The literal method allows for figures of speech because... We learn literal truth from figures of speech. Now, one of the guys you see on the screen here, this, this guy that you see on the screen is Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost, who's one of my old professors. I remember him so fondly. I remember one time he was teaching about Jesus. And he talked about how the disciples got the best education possible for three years, and it didn't cost them a red cent. This was the Dallas Theological Seminary, by the way. So one of the students, sharp-minded students, I should say, raised their hand and said to Dr. Pentecost, well, why can't Dallas Seminary be more Christ-like? <laughs> Dr. P said, well, you know, there must be a good answer to that, but I don't know it. You know? But anyway, he talked about the fact that if you got six months to study the book of Revelation, spend the first couple of months in the Old Testament because many of the symbols that you find in the book of Revelation are defined in the Old Testament. But there's also a number of cases in the book of Revelation where the symbols are defined right there in the context. For example, if you look at the bowls of incense, they're defined right there in the context as being the prayers of the saints. So the bottom line is that Scripture interprets Scripture. If you want to know how to interpret symbols, Scripture interprets Scripture. And by following that policy, we can come to understand what those symbols mean. Now, besides, I think a literal approach fits very well with uh, Revelation 119, a verse that was mentioned earlier this morning. And by the way, when t two people tell you the same thing, that means it's important. Okay? So Revelation 119 gives us a basic outline of Revelation. Right there for the things that you have seen. That's chapter 1 of Revelation. John sees the glorified Christ. And then he says, write those things that are. That relates to the seven churches of Asia Minor, in chapters 2 and 3. John was their overseer. He took care of them. And then, of course, in uh, uh, chapters 4 through 22, these are the things that take place after this, that is to say, futuristic prophecy. So I think a literal approach goes along with this very, very well. Now, all this is foundational to everything else I'm talking about. We start with methodology. Depending upon your method, you're going to end up in a different place. I say stay literal on Bible prophecy. It's what makes the best sense of the entire text. Debate number two, are Israel and the church distinct in Bible prophecy? Well, you know, there's a European scholar, Ronald DeProse, who said the church completely and permanently replaced ethnic Israel in the working out of God's plan and as, the, as a recipient of Old Testament promises addressed to Israel. And, of course, this is replacement theology. Now, I must tell you that they say that they're biblical and they cite Bible verses, but I think they get those Bible verses wrong. They say, cite Galatians 6.16, which refers to the church as the Israel of God, but I don't think that that supports their viewpoint. You see, Paul was a Jew who trusted in Jesus. He was a saved Jew. 
And Paul is talking about other saved Jews who had trusted in the Messiah. That's the Israel of God. Paul is not saying the church replaces ethnic Israel. That's nowhere in the context. Same thing with Galatians 3.29, which says that we are Abraham's offspring. All that this is saying is that just as Abraham was a man of faith, he was justified by faith, we are Abraham's spiritual children because we place faith in the Messiah too. The Abrahamic covenant promised not just blessings to Israel, but to the entire world. You see, so it's very much true that we are the spiritual offspring of Abraham, but the text does not say the church replaces Israel. That's completely missing from the context. Likewise, we are called the circumcision in Philippians 3.3. 3. But this is not referring to the Jewish ritual. This is talking to the reality that when you trust in Jesus, you experience a circumcision of the heart. In no place in Philippians does it say that the church replaced Israel. I think that these guys are, play, are, are playing eisegesis games. They're reading their meaning into the text. What's the proper method? Exegesis. Boy, that was good. Somebody was shouting it out over here. That's where you draw the meaning out of the text. You let the text speak for itself. I've got to tell you that there's three groups of, Bible, of, of, of people in Bible prophecy, and that is the Jews and the Gentiles and the church. And when you're talking about Bible prophecy, th let me just say in no uncertain terms, Israel means Israel. The church means the church. I can tell you in two words why the Bible is true. The Jews. Consider their preservation. The Jews are the only exiled people to remain a distinct people. They are the only people to return to their ancient homeland. They are the only people to have revived an ancient dead language. They are the only people to have restored their nation. Is that a miracle or what? Do you see God's hand in this, perhaps? I do, very much so. Uh, take a look at the rebirth of Israel. God promised his people, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I want you to see what's going on in this verse. This is in Ezekiel. And notice that the text says, I'm going to bring you not from one nation like the Babylonian captivity, but from all the nations of the world. Do you understand the significance of that? It's never happened before. It's never happened before. But once Israel became born again back in 1948, Jewish people have been returning in a state of unbelief every year since, every decade since, and it's going to continue. You see, I think that we're witnessing the fulfillment of biblical prophecy before our very eyes. And I believe that the New Testament continues to support the distinction between the church and Israel. 1 Corinthians 10.32 uh, portrays Paul as saying, do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Gentiles, or the church of God. In the book of Acts, the word Israel is used 20 times and the church 19 times. And then the apostle Paul goes on to discuss the future for Israel in Romans 9 through 11. Now pay attention to this. There's a scholar by the name of Peter Richardson who said that there is historical evidence that the term Israel was identified with the church, that the, there is no historical evidence that the term Israel was identified with the church before A.D. 160. So that means for more than a century after Paul's time, no such identification took place. But you see, after that time, that's when they started to spiritualize. And guess what? Now the church replaces Israel. You, you, you start to use a different methodology, and all of a sudden, you start to use or, or come up with different conclusions. Now, isn't it interesting that even with the people that disagree with us prophetically, we largely agree on a lot of other stuff like the deity of Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Trinity and all of those things? Why? Because we're using the same methodology, a literal method. But when you get to Bible prophecy, they go spiritual. Why is that? I think the father of lies might be behind it. Now, here's something that's very concerning to me personally. In the Abrahamic covenant, God promises, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. My friends in America, in, in, in this country, we have supported Israel traditionally. But today, many Americans are dishonoring Israel. And I think that includes our own government. And I would say this, my friends, woe unto any country whose government develops official policy 
directly stands against the Abrahamic covenant. Woe unto any country that does it. I believe that we are in trouble in this nation. I wish I had the time to go through it, but I believe we are at Romans 1 in this country. Judgment is impending. And what will kick that judgment into high gear is the rapture of the Christian church. Okay? I wish I could expand on that, but I don't have time. Uh, debate number three, what can we know about the signs of the time? Well, a sign is an event of prophetic significance that points to the end times. It's kind of like uh, intel, intel in advance. Various nations have intelligence agencies. For example, we have the CIA, Israel has the Mossad, Russia has the KGB, and these uh, various agencies provide intel to their governments. Well, in prophecy, God gives us intel in advance so that we know what the future is going to look like. And he does that with signs of the times. Now, some of the signs deal with the end of the church age, which is the age we're now in. Other signs deal with the first part of the tribulation period. But here's the key thing to remember. Even those signs that deal with the tribulation are casting their shadows before them so that we can see that the stage is being set for their fulfillment. One example is the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. See, that's going to take place in the tribulation period, but already they've raised the money. They've got the architectural plans. They've already pre prefabricated the robes and, and a variety of the artifacts to be used in the temple. I mean, the things are in motion for rebuilding the temple. That's what I mean by casting a shadow before the prophecy. Even though that's not going to be fulfilled until the tribulation, the, the fact is, is that we can see the stage now being set. So the signs of the time seem to indicate that we may be in the season of the Lord's return. I want to be careful here because no one knows the day or the hour. Never ever dates that. We don't know the day or the hour. But I do think that based on Matthew 24, 33, that we can know that we're in the general season of the Lord's return. And it's a time to be watching. It's a time to be paying attention to what's going on out there. Now I've broken the signs down into six categories. And uh, the super sign is Israel. Without Israel becoming born again, nothing else makes sense. But once that super sign takes place, everything else pulls together. Now, following this super sign, there's also national signs. You know what I mean by that? I'm talking about the alignment of nations in the end times. Now, how interesting that in Ezekiel 36 and 37, it's prophesied that Israel would become born again as a nation. But isn't it also interesting that as you continue reading in Ezekiel, chapters 38 and 39, we read about a coalition that's going to develop from the north, including Iran and Libya and Turkey and all the nations around the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, all the stand nations like Afghanistan and Turkmenistan and all of those, which are Muslim, by the way, joining in coalition with Russia to launch a massive invasion into Israel. Isn't it interesting to look at the time frame? First Israel is born again, and then sometime after that, there's going to be a northern coalition that starts to develop that will invade. I think that we're seeing the stage being set for that right now in our day. Already, we see alliances between these countries, including between Russia and Iran and Russia and Turkey and, uh, and Syria as well. And the fact is, is that Russia has a long track record of standing with the Muslims against Israel. It happened in the 1960s, happened in the 1970s. If you're unfamiliar with this, read my book, Northern Storm Rising. It goes into detail about this. By the way, I received a note from Homeland Security on that book, Northern Storm Rising. Homeland Security, and the agent said, the scenarios outlined in the book are quite viable given today's world's world tension. So I, I found that very interesting, very interesting. And it's all from the Bible, by the way. There's moral signs. Our country is going down the tubes. I mean, just take a look at our country over the last year. Who would have ever thought that we could possibly be in the state that we're in today, morally speaking? But it just seems like we are blind. And where are all the Christians standing up against it? What about the religious signs? I'm talking about apostasy. We've got apostasy within the Christian church. There are Christian leaders teaching that God is not all-powerful today or all-knowing. That's why we have evil today. There are Christian leaders teaching that Jesus made mistakes on earth and wasn't full deity. We've got Christian teachers saying that the gospel is not as defined in 1 Corinthians 15, but rather it's an opt-out program. That no matter what religion you hold to, 
you're still saved so long as you don't purposefully opt out of salvation, whether you're a Hindu or a Muslim. or any, Christian leaders are teaching this within the emerging church movement. We've got major apostasy, you see. So all of these things are coming to pass. We've got technological signs coming to pass. Just to give you one example of that, we learn from Revelation 13 that the Antichrist will wield economic control over the world. No one will be able to buy or sell without worshiping the Antichrist. But the only way he could do that, my friends, is if there was a cashless society. As long as people have dollar bills, that's not going to work. But if we had a cashless society in Revelation 13, the Antichrist could easily control the world economy. Well, guess what? We're going cashless right before our eyes. In fact, the evidence indicates that we use 70% less cash today than we did 10 years ago. The president of the Visa Corporation that makes the Visa card recently said that in the next five years it is entirely viable that you will have to pay a surcharge every time you try to use cash in any store. See, we're going cashless. As you drive down the street, money's taken out of your banking account uh, for your toll pay. For your salary, most of you get your money uh, deposited directly instead of getting a paycheck. We're going cashless. So that's what I mean by technological signs. And I point out a couple of dozen technological signs in my books. And then there, there, there's earth and sky signs. Earthquakes, you know, red moons, the sun going dark, wormwood and the deep impact it's going to have. It's interesting that our own Congress is bringing in experts right now on scenarios for when an asteroid is going to hit Earth. Did you know that? Our own Congress is dealing with that. The idea being that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. It's going to happen, they say. So right now, there is a large asteroid called Wormwood uh, that has trajectory planet Earth, and it will strike during the tribulation period. And by the way, it's after that time that it says the, the sun goes dark. One thing that happens after a deep impact is dust kicks up in the atmosphere, and then everything goes dark. Anyway, I could, go, I could blab for hours on this, but let me just say that we're witnessing a convergence factor. And what I mean by the convergence factor is that it seems like a bunch of signs are converging at a point in the not-too-distant future. They're all coming together, slowly, one by one. If we just saw one prophecy coming to pass, that would be one thing. But we're seeing multiple prophecies converging, which leads me to believe that we're in the season of the Lord's return. Just as the signs of the first coming came to pass literally, so the signs dealing with the second coming are coming to pass as well. And I believe that we are living on borrowed time, and the signs prove it. So my questions to you today is, are you ready? Are there any changes you need to make in your life today? Remember, the rapture is a signless event. You know, I've always prayed to the Lord that the rapture happened right in the middle of one of my sessions. That would be so cool. So, are you prepared if the rapture were to happen by the end of my message? I hope that you are, because once it happens, it happens. And you know, 1 John talks about some Christians being ashamed of his coming. Boy, woe unto you if you're in some kind of a weird sin right in the middle of that. Well, which view of the rapture is correct? Well, we really don't need to talk about this, I guess, since we had a session this morning on this. But I'm going to talk about it anyway, real quick. This is Dr. John F. Wolverd, my teacher on the rapture. He wrote the definitive book on the rapture, being a pre-trib rapture, and that's called The Rapture Question. I remember going up to Dr. Wolver one time and saying, Dr. Wolver, what if we're wrong? Just what if all of a sudden we see a leader sign an agreement with Israel, a covenant with Israel, and it becomes clear that we're in the tribulation period? What then? And he pondered for a moment and got a little bit of a grin on his face and said, I think I'll write a new book called Rethinking the Rapture. You know? <laughs> anyway, I believe that the pre-trib view is correct. Let me just give you a couple of quickies on this. First of all, Jesus took the punishment for my sins. We're not going to be punished a second time. Listen, Jesus purchased the church by his own blood, Acts chapter 20. We're not going to have a scenario where Jesus says, I purchased you and paid for all your sins. Now suffer on earth. That's not going to happen. Christ bought me. He paid a price for me. My sins have been paid for, and I'm not going to be in the tribulation period. I'm out of there, okay? I really firmly believe it. Besides, it doesn't deal with uh, the church. 
the tribulation deals with Israel. So we're not going to be subject to the seal, trumpet, and bold judgments. Furthermore, the church is missing in all the tribulation passages, whether you're talking Revelation 4 through 18 or any New Testament passage or any Old Testament passage on the tribulation. You simply won't find the church there. And this sounds like this morning too, doesn't it? Great minds think alike. That's all I can think. Uh, but again, like I said before, when two people say the same thing, better write that down. Now there's a qualification. There will be people who are believers during the tribulation period. There will be believers during the tribulation. But they become believers after the rapture. They become believers after the tribulation starts. And it could be the result of the two great prophets of Revelation 11 who will do mighty miracles. It could be the 144,000 Jewish evangelists of Revelation 7 and 14. It may be that some old recordings from Steel the Mind are going to be laying around. <laughs> and they watch those tapes. Wouldn't that be great? But the fact is, many, many will become believers during that time according to Revelation 7. Furthermore, the church is not appointed to wrath. Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1.9. And by the way, the Greek word for delivers there carries the idea, snatch out to oneself. Snatch out to oneself. That sounds an awful lot like 1 Corinthians 4.17, where believers are going to be caught up to be with the Lord, you see. God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that means the church cannot go through the great day of wrath. God's pattern is to rescue his people before his judgment on an unbelieving world falls. Whether you're talking about Enoch or Noah and his family or Lot or the spies that were safely out of Jericho, God takes his people out and then judgment falls. That's going to be the same thing with the rapture. God's going to take his people out at the rapture and then judgment falls. We're going to be kept from the hour of trial according to Revelation 3.10. Jesus, speaking to the church at Philadelphia, said, Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is to come on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Just make note of a couple of things here. First of all, keep you from carries the idea of take out of, remove from. Furthermore, hour of trial is an actual time period of tribulation. We're not talking about general tribulation. We're talking about a time period of, of tribulation. I don't think this is apply, applying only to the church at Philadelphia either. Because just a few verses later, the text says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. The churches. So the truth is beyond just Philadelphia. And I think it carries some truth for us in the end times here. So here's what it all comes down to. Christ could come for us at any moment. Are you ready? I pray that you are. Debate number five, how are we to understand the tribulation or, or the book of Revelation? How are we to understand the book of Revelation? But let me just say that in the historicist viewpoint, Revelation provides a prophetic overview of the entire panoramic sweep of church history from the first century up to the second coming. It's like a big, broad, wide-angle look at church history. The idealist view says that the book of Revelation is a symbolic descri uh, uh, description of the ongoing battle between good and evil and how good triumphs over evil in the end and or how Christ triumphs over the devil at the end. But the, the book of Revelation is not supposed to be describing any specific events. It's just kind of a, a general description of this battle between good and evil. And then the preterist view uh, basically is based upon a Latin word that means past and it says that Matthew 24 and 25 along with the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled and that took place when Titus and his Roman warriors overran Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. So those are the, the basic viewpoints. And can you guess which one I am? Anyone? 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 Futurist. Futurist. Absolutely. $500 for that man. No. <laughs> you can get it in heaven, okay? <laughs> the prophecies are yet future. So what I told you before from Revelation 119, right there for the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. The things that you have seen refer to chapter 1 for the description of Christ in glory. The things that are relate to the seven churches of Asia Minor over which John was the overseer. That's in, in chapters 2 and 3. And then the things that take place after this in chapters 4 and following. That's the future part. To me it makes perfect sense. And the plain sense makes good sense. Seek no other sense. You see, it just makes, it lines up perfectly in my mind. Now, just a quick note on preterism. Uh, very often we'll go to Matthew 24, 34, which says, Truly I say to you, 
this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. They say that that was written in the first century. Because it was written in the first century, it must mean that that generation will not, take, will not go away until everything take place, which means that that supports the 70 AD judgment on Jerusalem. That's the idea there. I don't agree with that. You have to read verses in context. Now you tell me, what's Matthew 24 all about? The tribulation period. Matthew 24 is all about the tribulation. And when you look at it, it's describing various events of the tribulation. For example, it talks about the abomination of desolation. That's when the Antichrist is going to set up an image of himself inside the Jewish temple. So he's describing the tribulation and various events that take place in the tribulation. And then he says, this generation will not pass away until all things uh, take place. What generation are we talking about? The tribulation generation. Contextually, he's talking about the tribulation. That generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, how long is the tribulation? Seven years. Is it not reasonable to assume that people who are alive during the tribulation will probably, in some sense, be there for a lot of the tribulation, except for the martyrs and people who die? It makes good sense to me, and when the plain sense makes good sense, you see, you see where I'm going. Furthermore, there's no cosmic events that are described as taking place back in A.D. 70. I don't remember anything about Jesus returning in glory with the armies of heaven back in A.D. 70. And furthermore, the book of Revelation was dated in the 19... or not in the 1990s, back in the 90s. Back in the 90s. Now, that can't possibly be referring to 70 A.D. or it would be speaking in past tense. You see, it's dated in the 90s. And there's all kinds of good evidence for that. Some of you may not know that there was a great uh, debate between Hank Hanegraaff and Mark, Mark Hitchcock. Anybody see that? I was there, okay? And if you watch the film of it, John Ankerberg, you'll see me right there. <laughs> and Han Hanegraaff got annihilated. Bible Answer Man got smashed into oblivion. You know, Mark Hitchcock used to be with the district attorney's office, <laughs> argues very well, and presented devastating evidence against preterism. Anyway, I felt so sorry for Hank Hanegraaff that I went up to him afterwards and I said, well, wow, put my arm around him, wow, you sure are a brave guy, you know, <laughs> to come here to this pre-trib meeting and, and, and try to share all this stuff. He was just really dejected after that and he, he said, I don't know why I even did it. I don't know why I even did it. But anyway, I just don't think the evidence supports it. I think that the plain sense of pre-tribulationism is infinitely more preferable. Now quickly as my time is running out, uh, debate number six, how are we to understand the Antichrist? Well, there's a lot I can say about that. I did write a book called Unmasking the Antichrist. And uh, in church history, different people have had uh, different concepts about uh, the Antichrist. It was mentioned this morning something about Bill Clinton. Well, you know, um, <laughs> the real idea there is that Bill was the Antichrist and Hillary was the false prophet. That was the, you know, okay. So just so, the, just so we got that clear, okay? <laughs> now, some people say it's a myth, the Antichrist is a myth, and this is the liberal Christians out there who say the Bible is a fallible document and they're anti-supernaturalist. They deny anything miraculous taking place. And so they deny that there's a real person called the Antichrist. Other people say it's an institution of evil, you know, like the early Roman Empire. The early Roman, Roman Empire attacked the Christian church. And so maybe that's kind of like the Antichrist. Some modern people say it's Islam. It could be a personification of evil, according to some people. Just as Uncle Sam personifies America, so the Antichrist personifies evil. He represents all that is evil. Now, my friends, I must tell you, we need to take a biblical approach. I'm reminded of a little second grade girl who came home from school one day, and she was so excited about what she learned in Sunday school. And so her daddy said, well, what did you learn in Sunday school? And she said, Dad, it is just so awesome. You see, God created Adam first. And then God saw that it was not good for Adam to be alone. So God put him to sleep and took out his brains and made a woman of them. <laughs> and all the women said, yeah. nah, that's not biblical. 
That's not biblical. That's second illusions, chapter 3. We must, must be biblical. And if you take a biblical look at the Antichrist, you're going to see that he's a real person. In the book of Revelation, he's portrayed as a person. He speaks as a person. He acts like a person. He's treated like a person. You know, if you walk like a duck and you quack like a duck, are you a duck? You're a duck. All right, if you talk like the Antichrist, you speak like the Antichrist, you act like a... I mean, you're a person. This guy is not a myth. He is a real, genuine person. Uh, he's called the Christ, whereas the Antichrist is called the Antichrist. He's called the man of, Christ is called the man of sorrows. The Antichrist is called the man of lawlessness. Christ is called the son of God. The Antichrist is called the son of destruction. Uh, Christ is called the lamb, whereas the Antichrist is called the beast. Christ is called the Holy One, whereas the Antichrist is called the Lawless One. Christ came to do the Father's will. The Antichrist came to do his own will. Christ is energized by the Holy Spirit. The Antichrist is energized by Satan. Christ submitted to God. The Antichrist defies God. Christ humbled himself. The Antichrist exalts himself. Christ cleansed the temple. The Antichrist defiles the temple. Christ was slain for the people. The Antichrist slays the people. Uh, Christ was received up into heaven, whereas the Antichrist will be cast into the lake of fire. Now, there's just so much that I could talk about here. Now, real quickly, which view of the millennium is correct? Amillennialism says Christ is presently ruling over the church in a spiritual way. That violates the literal method, so I reject it. Postmillennialism says that through the church's progressive influence, the world will be Christianized before Christ returns, and the world's going to get better and better and better. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you think the world is getting better and better and better? Okay. If anybody raised their hands, we do have counselors here to <laughs> meet with you after the session today. This is not a realistic scenario, aside from the fact that Scripture denies this. I mean, if you look at uh, you know, 1 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4, 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 4 through 18, etc., etc., the world gets much worse before Christ comes again. Premillennialism is my viewpoint that's based on a literal interpretation. It's based on unconditional covenant promises to Abraham and David. There will be a literal 1,000-year kingdom over which Christ rules. Now, quickly, is it okay to set dates? Some say yes. 88 reasons why the rapture will be in 1988. You know what? These guys are all characterized by one character trait. Wacko. Okay? <laughs> Wacko. You don't go setting dates, my friends. First of all, the track record is abysmal, 100% wrong. Second, you might end up making harmful decisions for your life, like delaying going to college or stop saving for your future. Don't do that. You might damage your faith. You might lose the motivation to live in purity as you await the coming of the Lord. You might end up in prophetic agnosticism, the idea that you just can't know for sure about a lot of this stuff. You might fall into sensationalism. Scripture says to be sober-minded, not sensationalistic. Furthermore, humanists and atheists love to watch Christians set dates. And then when they don't pan out, what do they do? They write articles in the humanist magazine. They love to attack us. Why give ammo to the enemies of Christianity? Well, let me just close, my friends. So much more I could say. I wish I had four or five hours with you. But still the mind said, no way. You get 45 minutes. So let me just close with this. Where do we stand today? Well, first of all, we're witnessing a convergence of prophecies today. Let me, as you can see on the screen, as predicted, Israel has been reborn as a nation. Hallelujah. As predicted, the Jews have been streaming back to their homeland in unbelief from the various nations around the world. But also today, tensions in the Middle East have never been higher in fulfillment of Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. A coalition of Muslim nations have already aligned with Russia, and the stage is being set for the Ezekiel invasion. Meanwhile, there is widespread apostasy. Scoffers continue to mock the idea that Christ is coming soon. A multiplicity of false prophets have arisen, preparing the way for the emergence of the false prophet. And a multiplicity of false religions is preparing the way for the emergence of the end times false religion. Furthermore, planet Earth is going cashless, preparing the way for the Antichrist control of the economy. Modern technologies have facilitated taking the gospel to every nation. Modern technologies are in place to facilitate a global government. 
I could go on for two or three hours more just on this part. But my point to you is, we are living in a day when all of this stuff is happening. Even nuclear weapons continue to proliferate. Weapons that may be used to burn a third of the earth, a third of the trees, and all of the green grass, accompanied by the outbreak of loathsome sores, as Revelation chapter 8 describes. So how should we live? Did I share all this to scare you to death? Not at all. Our Lord reigns. Do not fear, for God is in control. When the Lord was talking about prophecy in John 14, 1 to 3, what did he say? Do not let your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. Do not fear the one who controls the future. You see, God is the one that we worship. He is the one who controls all things. You don't have to worry about the devil or the antichrist. Next, live with anticipation. Folks, it could be this afternoon that we're all with the Lord in heaven. We don't know when he's coming. For the day is coming, and I think it's coming quickly. And then finally, focus on fidelity. You know, among the ancients, especially among the ancient Hebrews, a man and a woman would get betrothed, and then the groom would go off to his daddy's house, and he would build on an extra wing. He would build an extra room where they would live. And at an indeterminate time when he finished, the groom would come back to get his bride and take his bride to the place that he just built in his father's house. Meanwhile, the purpose of the bride was to remain in purity. She was to show her fidelity. She was not to cheat on her husband. My friends, the same is true of us as the bride of Christ. You see, our groom has gone to heaven to prepare a place for us in the Father's house. And soon he's going to come for us. He's going to claim his bride and take us to be where he is. But meanwhile, we are to show our fidelity to him. Don't compromise. Don't compromise with the world. Don't be a faker. Don't be guilty of the sin of partial obedience. Christ seeks complete obedience. Let that be said of each one of us. Maranatha and Shalom. This has been Eight Great Debates in Bible Prophecy, presented by Ron Rhodes. To receive a free catalog of over 250 awesome Bible studies on DVD or CD, all using and defending a literal translation of the Bible, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of the missionary outreach trips to Israel, call Compass at 800-977-2177, 24 hours a day. Or visit us on the web at compass.org.